Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, that it's we're we're not going to be saying that much <laughs> anymore. I'm not going to be Alex anymore. No, we we won't be able to say welcome to Delve soon. It's 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 almost that time. I made myself sad for five seconds. That's not good. Um, <laughs> oh, no, don't be sad. No, don't be sad. We'll have to figure out the new intro for the new one, so it's fine. We can say, welcome to not Dell yeah. for like a month. Yeah, what, what what we'll do is something like just, just uh, Nathan, Alex, TPK, here we go. <laughs> just <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Uh, but anyway, uh, and as we kind of come to uh, a full circle of uh, Delve, <laughs> uh, it got us thinking a little bit about the hero's journey. Uh, it, this is actually something, just a little bit of context, you, you had originally, uh, brought up that we should do an episode about it to me, um, yes. and, uh, what was the inspiration that you had to, to bring that to the table? I think it was actually the fact that where, what we're doing currently, um, kind of follows a pattern that would also follow the hero's journey, where we started... Uh, and then we're going to go through it, but you know, there's the beginning, midpoint, end point, and then like the rebirth mm -hmm. after the end there. Oh, yeah. And it's like, what if we did like a hero's journey and kind of related it to ourselves in the show leading up to the new show? That's a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Now, some people might not know that like actually one of the orbitals that I did uh, a long time ago was actually about Joseph Campbell going through the different uh, stages of the hero's journey as well. Uh, so I was a little bit familiar with it coming in, and I was like, oh, yeah, we haven't actually talked about something that's very important for story structure and and character development. And boy, wouldn't it be a good idea to do that on the show? Maybe it's a good idea to do that on the show. Especially at the tail end. Why don't we do it now? <laughs> um, so I, I thought before we jump into the different stages, because this actually fits perfectly into a three-act structure, so we're going to just do three episodes with the different uh, stages. Um, but before we jump into the first stage, I thought, if you'll allow me, I'd like to talk just a little bit about Joseph Campbell. Sure. And kind of the history of Okay, great. Um, so, uh, so Joseph Campbell uh, was an American philosopher, or uh, I think of him as a philosopher, but he was a professor of literature. And he, um, he covered many aspects of human experience, but he was best known for a book that was published in 1949 called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And um, this is basically where he discussed the theory of the journey of an archetypal hero. He was mostly applying it to mythology. Uh, so if you, if you think about some of the classic journeys of like the Odyssey or the Aeneid or anything like that, that's mostly what he studied and he saw themes in those. Um, he, uh, he had a very famous phrase that he used all the time called follow your bliss. Uh, that's usually what he talked about when he went on a lot of these, uh, you know, talk shows because he was very popular in the, in the mainstream. And then in Hollywood sort of recognized him a little bit more when a certain filmmaker called George Lucas credited him with influencing Star Wars. Uh, and so if you actually go back through the Star Wars saga, I'm sure we're going to be talking a little bit about that here, um, you will notice some of these themes cropping up <laughs> in what is, uh, it, it's called the hero's journey, but it is usually referred to, the, the structure is called the monomyth, essentially right. the, the mythology of the, of the singular person. A couple important points to make note of right here is that uh, there are three major stages. So we'll be talking about those departure, initiation, and return. There are a lot of sub-stages, which is what we're going to be getting into in each one of these. Not all tales, and they are very quick to mention this, will include all of those sub-stages. Right. Uh, th 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 some of them do. You may see them. But it is not necessarily true of every epic quest. But these are different things that you might see touched on as touchstones. And, uh, and this can apply to pretty much anyone. That's the other thing that's important to note. Uh, you can see this just as much with something like Star Wars as you could see it in like a Hunger Games or a Harry Potter or a Lord of the Rings. What about it, The Little Mermaid? Uh, actually, probably The Little Mermaid, <laughs> actually. Um, I, I have to think about that for a second. We'll... we'll 
we'll think back about Ariel's journey when we're doing this. If I can remember The Little Mermaid, it, it probably applies to The Little Mermaid, too. Fair enough. I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it does somewhere. It probably doesn't apply to Twilight. But the thing is, sorry, that was very, mean. Very okay. true. Very true. <laughs> All right. So, that being said, uh, let's jump in to uh, the first major phase, which we're going to be discussing on this episode. And that is... Act one. Act one, scene one. <laughs> Departure. We, we jump on a boat and we go on an adventure. That sounds fun, right? Or we get in a car or a plane. And we hit a bear. Yeah. In the plane. <laughs> we hit the bear in the plane. Yes. All okay. the bears die in plane accidents. That's how that's how bears do, you know? <laughs> All right. So let's talk about some of the substages of departure. So uh, in order to make this a little bit uh, easier to understand for each one of these, I also kind of gave a little bit of a synopsis in my own words about uh, k kind of my understanding of each one of these phases that might help explain it a little bit better. I'm just going to say the first part is uh, a call to adventure, or as I like to refer to it, you are drawn forward into a new and terrifying path. Every day. Every single day. <laughs> I would say that this is almost universal when it comes to stories of, of character development in one way or another, this is the point where something comes to you and says, well, we got to go in a new direction. Uh, this is, this is in many ways, I know that you like Farscape a lot, so this would be basically John Crichton uh, saying, uh, well, you know what? I, I think I can get into this ship and I can, you know, use the gravity to get through a wormhole and then, uh-oh, I'm in a whole new place. In, in many ways, he's his own call to adventure in that particular story. Um, but uh, in other ways, you could look at, like, Lord of the Rings. You know, Frodo's just chilling out in the Shire. Yeah, he is. And, and then, uh, then Gandalf comes along and is like, uh, Frodo, we gotta, we gotta go take this uh, ring to the Mount Doom. You gotta get off your butt. We gotta go. So, um, departure is also called action, right? Or is that one of the later sub-steps in it? As I think you could refer to the call to adventure as also, like, essentially call to action. You could call it that, too. Um, because that is, that is essentially, this is the starting point. This is the get out of bed, we're going on a mission. Um, I, I think that that's just another way of talking about it. A call to action. Um, you are getting from extraneous sources the information that, well... We're going down this path now, and it's not necessarily the path that you chose, but it's the path that we have to go down now. Right. Um, so I think I think you might say call to action would be a more modern wording of the call call to adventure, if uh, if I'm thinking about it correctly. Sure. Uh, we we say that a lot, of course, just in media because call to action is is asking other people to, you know, do something that we're asking them to do. So essentially, in many ways, a call to action is us as, as creators or, you know, media people doing a call to adventure for our listeners. Right. In some ways. How does that actually relate to Delve? Well, <laughs> well, we got a call to adventure of sorts. Of sorts. Of we got sorts. a call to creation. We, we actually kind of answered a call to action, I guess is a better way to put it. We did. That that led to a call to adventure, which which was from the Mad Adventure Society. It was. Uh, it was when, I believe, Brian Casey had uh, put out a thing about, hey, anyone have an idea that for a podcast I want to throw on this net, like the network that I'm making? And then we did, and he, uh, we said no backsies. Yeah, and then... we never looked back. And we didn't look the... forward either, honestly. No, we didn't. <laughs> there was no. There was not a lot of forward thinking there. But uh, um, in terms of because this is like I said, this is almost universal of storytelling. Are there any particular beginnings of uh, you know a, a hero story that you particularly like? Oh, like in media and stuff. In media, in fiction, in books and television. 
The beginning is always. I find the beginning always really more interesting when the beginning isn't is in media res, anyways. Yeah. Um, in a lot of cases where it's just starting in the action instead of being like a cold open. Right. Because like in Star Wars, it's kind of a cold open, but like hey, here's Luke. Yeah. So it's kind of no. And Star Wars starts in media res. It doesn't start with Luke's story. Well, the original Star Wars. It doesn't start with Luke's story. It starts on the Rebel ship. So it starts with the precursor to what's going to happen, and then the call to action. Then you find out who the hero is. So. In many ways, if we were looking at it in terms of Luke's story, his, his call to adventure really does start when Obi-Wan comes to him and... Uh, you know, it, it, he he finds the recording and everything, and then he has to go on the adventure. It turns out maybe he has force powers and all that good stuff. But there's other extraneous things happening before that. I, I would say that it's kind of interesting that you make mention of that because they don't really specifically discuss this in The Hero's Journey as far as I know, but there are always going to be like, the world around the hero is always going to be doing stuff that leads the hero to go on that journey. So, I mean, it doesn't all happen in a vacuum, um, regardless of what the storyline is. You know, Harry Potter, for instance, can get the, you know, the little thing that says he's going to Hogwarts Academy, and that leads him on his journey. But there is a whole backstory about what happened with who shall not be named and uh and his parents and and his history and of course the history of hogwarts and the wizarding world and everything like that there there's always going to be like stuff before the hero comes into play i i always felt like the hero's journey is specifically the cyclical nature of that hero when we start and then eventually end their story yeah so i liked that in a, a star wars for instance like you mentioned there's stuff going on before we actually meet the hero, but I would say that the hero's journey itself, the call to adventure, really starts when you meet Luke. And uh, and, and Luke ends up meeting Obi-Wan, and, and the rest is history. This next part is not necessarily used in every scenario, and that is the refusal of the call. Or, as I like to put it, you don't want to go down a new and terrifying path. <laughs> right. Somebody came to you, they said, yep, this is what we're doing, and you go, nah. <laughs> Sounds like a terrible idea, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I know um, there have been stories of D&D games, for instance, yep. where the DM will set up the plot and whatever, and, the, and there's not really a session zero ahead of time, so people make their characters, and it's like, oh yeah, here's kind of what you guys are doing, like, in character. Like, you mm. have to get on the ship, and go to this place, it's your mission. And I've definitely heard stories of, like, a character that was made. It's like, yeah, no, I'm scared of boats and water, so I'm not going with you guys. Like, right. their character just straight up was like, yeah, no, I'm not going. Bye. <laughs> and so the player just has to make a new character. Because it's like, all right, well, you didn't discuss that before. And so now we introduce a character to de-introduce them. Which makes it more interesting for the other party members. Because they'll be like, oh, we had this other guy, but he didn't want to go. Because he's scared of water. It's like, yeah, we need you to go across the ocean. And like, if for instance, Nathan, this shark-filled ocean. And I you're just like, you'd say that. you're just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, no, I'm I'm good. I'm going to stay here. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, well, this 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 was a fun journey. <laughs> but then, of course, if you're going to if you're going to do it like this is now your first essentially trial to see if you're able to to rise to the challenge. This this isn't used as often in media as it might as it probably should be because i just think it's interesting character development uh, i think more... it probably isn't because especially like tv and stuff you don't want to start the show off with your call to adventure being refused unless there's a good storytelling reason for it right because then it's like oh yeah here's what this show is about oh in the first episode this character is like here's your call to adventure or whatever it is and they're just like nah i'm good and then they just go about their, like, normal day. And then they get dragged into it later, obviously, because that's what happens with the refusal. May and you know what would be interesting? It's, like, a, a show that does this, but, like, the whole first season is, like, the refusal of everything that is their call to adventure. <laughs> and then during the end of it, they just, they just get dragged into it. I'm trying to think if I've seen anything that would actually, that would actually work for this. Um, 
Oh my god, I kind of want to say Justified was sort of like that, because when when Raylan, uh, <laughs> after Raylan like gets transferred back to his hometown, <laughs> he doesn't want to be there the entire time. <laughs> He he's just angry that he that he has to go back home and has to deal with people that he grew up with, and, um, and then like later on starts to accept it. I always felt like that's sort of a refusal. You you you've been you've been forced into this position, but you didn't want to do it in the first place. Just um, getting straight bamboozled into it. Yeah, you just get straight bamboozled into it. Well, actually, come come to think of it, we were mentioning Farscape. John Crichton kind of has that going on, doesn't he? Uh, in which sense? Well, after, like, after he's gotten to to the far-flung galaxy that he ends up in, he's not all that happy that he's there and basically just wants to try and get home. Like, I mean, uh, that's the entire premise of the series. That's true. That's true. I mean, he comes to accept being there, but he wants to go home the whole time. You know, that's true of some stories. A lot of times, though, I think we get used to the fact that the hero just wants to go on that adventure once they've been called to it. Because I think for a lot of us, at least for, you know, me, um, somebody says, you want to go on an adventure? And a lot of us are like, boy, howdy, that would be terrific. <laughs> Let's do that. It, it, it seems like a break from the mundane. But some people are really just happy where they are and don't want to go on that adventure. Um, I definitely love being home in my environment and comfy, and it's like, but at the same time, if someone's like, "You want to go on an adventure?" I'm like, "Well, what's the adventure? Like, exactly. what, what do you want to? What do you want to go do? Yeah, because that determines if I want to go. Like, exactly. you want to go? They're like, "Do you want to go hiking?" And I'm like, "No, nah, I'm good." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, come to think of it, uh, like Frodo. If we look at, like, Lord of the Rings, Frodo was pretty much on board to go, but if I remember correctly, in The Hobbit, Bilbo, not as much. Bilbo kind of liked having his just, his simple life in the Shire, and then a bunch of these dwarves just barge in and take over his house, and he's not happy about any of this to begin with. <laughs> like, he is not having any of this. Um, so I think that that's probably more the refusal of the call than anything else. Yeah, sometimes you just gotta have a party full of dwarves break in. Mm-hmm. After a party full of dwarves break into your house, I think that all bets are off. I'm pretty sure that that's how that works. Uh, okay, so this one, this one I actually do see quite a bit. Uh, supernatural aid, or as you might also be able to think of it, you go down a new and terrifying path because a magic figure helped you out. Boy, do I love magic figures. But actually, this is very true. You have your Gandalf, um, you have your Dumbledore, you have your um, your Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know, in many ways, this is true of a lot of different kinds of fiction. There is something larger than you that says, "Hey, you you, you might not necessarily want to go. Maybe you're on board." But you need some guidance, and you need someone that's going to be able to show you how to get from, you know, point A where you're at to point B. Could we put Genie from Aladdin into this group? Yeah, actually, come to think of it, so, so Aladdin's call to adventure is sort of when he finds the lamp. You know, because he's, he's a thief the entire time, and then uh, he gets the call to adventure to steal this lamp. Yeah, then he graduates from a thief to a con artist. And then he graduates to a con artist, which becomes a whole lot easier when it turns out there's a magic genie in that lamp. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I would say, yeah, that would be a supernatural aid. Um, hey, go back to your little mermaid for a oh, second. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, Ariel, uh, you know, she didn't just get her legs. She just sprout legs from her tail. Just sprouted legs. Wasn't that Ursula? That actually I gave feel them. like it was. I haven't watched Little Mermaid in probably in two time. decades. Yeah, I have not seen it since it was in theaters. <laughs> so just to give you an idea. I feel like but that was if, like 1994. Yeah, yeah. It was a very long time ago. But since we were going to talk about Little Mermaid, um, yeah, I would say that actually, I think it was Ursula. So there, there was an extraneous force that actually got her the legs that ends up letting her go on to land. And by going on to land... We really, we really start that journey, and that's supernatural aid. So, yeah, I, I think something extraneous, the main point being that it has to be some kind of a figure or 
or entity that is able to do things beyond what you are capable of currently doing that kind of pushes you forward. And the, the interesting thing, as I'm sure we'll talk about later, is that that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't eventually get there, but you need to have something kind of like push you in that general direction. That's how uh, I function with most things. With most things, someone comes along, pushes you on the back, and gets you to where you want to be. <laughs> Will I start a journey on my own? God, no. If, will I do it if someone else gives me a Scooby snack? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take a Scooby snack. When we talk about supernatural aid, a lot of times you're probably thinking about magic, which makes sense for a medieval setting. So if you were talking about, in, in terms of uh, tabletop RPGs, if you were talking about something like a, like a D&D, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it can just be something technologically superior as well. Sure. Or, or something divine. Or something divine. Or something divine, absolutely. It could be, yeah, absolutely. A god or a pantheon could uh, ask you to go on that mission. I think in God of War, you could actually say that that's sort of how Kratos... Are we going to call Kratos a hero? I don't know if we're going to call... I think he's an anti-hero. Yeah. The, the structure of God of War might be similar to sure, the hero's sure, journey. Sure. But he's but... definitely not a hero. He killed no. a lot of people and a lot of gods. And and also and also his motivation is not necessarily very pure. If you remember if you remember in the first God of War, Kratos' entire mission is take vengeance on Ares. <laughs> Literally his entire motivation is Yeah, yeah. Take it and then the, the games after that is basically take vengeance on all the gods and all the Titans <laughs> and basically yep. everybody else in my way. Yep. Um and then in the uh, in the remake that they did, uh, he says "boy" a lot. So there's that. Boy. So here we go. This is one that we might want to dissect a little bit. Crossing of the first threshold. Okay, so now that you have prepared for your new path, it's time for your first battle. Essentially, crossing of the first threshold is that you've accepted your quest, you have been armed for the dangers that are in front of you, and now, it's time to actually face a challenge. A lot of times that challenge is in the form of an actual opponent. Um, this is like the first time you have to battle, uh, uh, like, uh, Misty in Pokemon. <laughs> first, first Pokemon gym. All those goblins have led up to this goblin shaman. That's right, now you have the goblin shaman. This is the first boss, basically. This is not do. the. This is the asylum demon in in Dark Souls. This is sure. <laughs> having having played so much of Dark Souls, I don't think I ever got to an asylum demon. That's like the first boss in like what Dark Souls three. Oh, I didn't play Dark Souls three. Oh, you mean that big dude that you have to run away from? At yeah, the first that game? first boss. Oh, like, that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I did. I did take care of that one. Yeah, is that Dark Souls one or three? One. Oh, yeah, it's that That's guy. That's the first one. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. You don't fight him. You run away. Yeah, you you run away. So basically, yeah, your call to it. I think in Dark Souls, your call to adventure is, well, good luck getting out of this. <laughs> if you don't if you don't handle the call, you're basically going to die. Your refusal of the call is, I don't want to die. And then your supernatural aid is uh, apparently going through a portal. <laughs> And, and getting to to a big boss that you can't handle, and it's like, oh, I need to find a very high spot to jump off of so they can land on his head. Um, I would say that in other kinds of media, I'm, Lord of the Rings kind of does this, I guess, with the Nazgûls. I almost want to say that that's like the first big thing. In Harry Potter, it's the first time, like actually in Sorcerer's Stone, bef by the end of Sorcerer's Stone, he's dealing with, uh, wh what's his name? Uh... The one who shall not be named. <laughs> That's why you couldn't think of his name. Yeah, exactly. I can never think of the actual name. Um, in in Star Wars, though, because Star Wars actually probably follows it closer than almost anything. Um, the it, it, it's that first real confrontation with Darth Vader. It's it's actually probably for Luke. It's the Death Star. Yeah. Trench so when run. Um, oh, the trench run. I would say the trench run. Is really I, I would the, figure the first one is when the, oh, they run away from that when Obi-Wan gets killed. Exactly. They run away from that. Uh, Obi-Wan, that, that's Obi-Wan's battle that he, I guess technically he wins. Oh yeah, he wins that, don't worry. He, he wins it, even though he doesn't, even though Vader doesn't necessarily know that. But I would say for Luke, 
Luke, it's when you get to the trench run, and um, and he eventually has to use the training that he's gotten for the entire movie to be able to actually blow up the Death Star. Sure. Um, that that really feels like the actual crossing of the first threshold, and uh, and, and that's that's always an important step, as we're going to find out in later stages. But uh, knowing that you've been able to prepare for at least a lesser battle for larger battles to come. Um, since Campbell was so familiar with mythology, uh, I'm sure he was probably thinking a little bit more in terms of maybe Beowulf or like Odysseus in this realm. Um, Beowulf at, probably with Grendel. And then like uh, Odysseus probably when he actually gets to the Trojan horse part and he has to actually storm the gates and, and win the war essentially. Makes uh, sense. Yeah. I find those stories really interesting because if you, if you think about it, that's kind of where those stories start. Like they don't, they don't actually spend much time talking about the actual call to adventure and stuff. You just kind of accept that that happened off screen before the actual stories happen. <laughs> Like, like they never spent time explaining that Odysseus was, yeah, yeah, Odysseus went off to, to the call to war so that he could travel across the seas and, and get there. No, pretty much the story picks up when Odysseus is there, <laughs> just in the middle of the war. Why, why worry about it? I can talk about Iron Man. Sure. Because that would be, uh, what, uh, Ironmonger was the first, was at the end of, of the first movie, um... That one was interesting because that one actually did start in media res. Yeah. Uh, you you actually kind of see, you see his life beforehand, but then the actual part where they pick up is pretty much where he's already in it. Right. Um, and, and, uh, and, and he's got to make his own call to adventure just so that he can escape captivity. <laughs> yeah. And, and then there, his backstory is told essentially after uh, you, you've been introduced to it. Um, but that's crossing of the first threshold. Do you have any examples of crossing of the first threshold that you particularly liked? Uh, I can't think of one offhand right now, I don't think. I think the other hallmark of first threshold, too, is you kind of have to take things you have learned up to that point and apply them to that battle. It's not just like, oh, I just go and take care of it. It has to be informed by the story up to that point. Like, in, in the Star Wars scenario, Luke is only able to uh, destroy the Death Star because of, of his training and being able to uh, use the Force, Luke. Like use the Force, Luke. Use the Force. In, you know, in, in Harry Potter, the first time that he actually has to deal with with the one who can't be named because <laughs> I can't remember the name. Um, oh, I it, know the name. I just don't feel like helping you out. Oh, okay. Thank you. Because um, he shall not be named. Yeah, this this is true. Um, a lot of it has to be informed by the story up to that point and everything that he's learned at Hogwarts. Right. Uh, so, and, and, and actually in a lot of ways, even Lord of the Rings, Frodo's journey up to the point where... What would what would really be the first threshold for Frodo? I'm trying to think. Is it Boromir? Maybe. When I think maybe when because now one of his friends is being you know, uh, y you know, pulled to the side and he's got to refuse his. I kind of feel like though it's probably the Nazgul's when they're trying to escape the Nazgul's. Sure. But uh, and then he has to learn about the temptation of the ring too. So. Again, you get informed by the story up to that point. Um, it's not just a, a matter of, oh, yeah, I was pretty kick-ass to begin with, and now I'm more kick-ass to, <laughs> to, to speak of. I, I want to I wanna use one other example, though. I'd want to use probably Hunger Games as an example, because, uh, you know, Katniss survives, I would say, the first... Actually... Actually, first threshold in Hunger Games is basically the whole movie. <laughs> um, it's basically it's basically uh, the the whole thing where they're actually in the Hunger Games and you have to survive and be the last one standing. But everything that she has to do is informed by her journey up to that point. Right. Uh, and and everything that she's learned and her ability to hunt and her ability it, it, like like information before she really took the call to adventure. 
which she imposed upon herself, actually, because she wanted to take the place of her sister. But right up until the end where she has to learn and she has to grow in order to survive and be the last one standing. Well, and then Pete is also there. But yeah, always. <laughs> Pete is also there. Um, <laughs> that, that was my plus one for the Hunger Games. <laughs> You've run your fair share of games more than I have. I suppose, uh, yeah. Yeah, and you've probably played more, to be honest, than Over I the have. many years? Probably. <laughs> when your party hits that first, we'd say, boss battle, do you see examples of that um, being informed by the character's journey up to that point? Potentially. I don't think many of the games I've been in or have uh, dip, like run... I haven't necessarily Ooh. followed the formula of the hero's journey ever. Um, right. Like with Hephaestus, um, I think that the first overcome would have been like breaking out of jail for them, and then joining the resistance. So it was, it was, it was breaking out of jail and making a run for it, and then finding their way to the, the underground, essentially, and being informed of what was going on, and like agreeing to fight with them to do whatever they needed to do. To get rid of this this bad guy, that's uh that's fair. Uh, I don't necessarily know if tabletop games think to organize themselves in the way of the hero's journey. I think you kind of stumble upon that because again, the individuals are kind of making the story themselves. You don't have one central writer, right? Like you do in in fiction, you you have a collection of people that are are building the story. So it doesn't necessarily follow uh, the, the structure as precisely. Um, oh, it definitely doesn't. No. <laughs> but I do like to think that a lot of times when confronted with uh, a new threat or really the first big threat, you like to take your character up to that point and think about the knowledge that you've imposed. Sometimes just because of your character sheet tells you so. But um, that you're using a lot of your skills that you've built up over the time that you've been playing to to deal with that threat. You might not be thinking too much about it, but obviously, depending on what class you're playing, the skills and abilities that you've accrued over the course of your playtime then allow you to actually take care of that um, that that problem when you hit it. So I, I don't think it's necessarily inherent that you go through the hero's journey, but you might inadvertently stumble upon it <laughs> when you're playing. And then the, the last stage, which I don't necessarily see a lot in Departure, but I kind of understand what they're talking about, is referred to as the belly of the whale. And that is where you descend into the realm of the unknown. I am going to assume that when they talk about the belly of the whale, they're probably either talking about Jonah or that they're talking about Pinocchio. <laughs> like, I'm guessing that's where the title gets its its name. <laughs> well, I know for, like, if I go back to that reference from Hephaestus, Belly of the Unknown for us would have been after we broke out of jail. We d dove into this world of underground tactics to get rid of a tyrant, essentially. Right. You know, that's an unknown world to us, and we just kind of dove in and immersed ourselves in this world now. So yeah, braving either the approximation, another uh, braving either the approximation of death or death itself. I would say that if we were looking at Star Wars, at, if you were looking at A New Hope as by itself a hero's journey, um, with like the Death Star being like your final confrontation, uh, I would say probably the trash compactor. <laughs> that's <laughs> a literal probably, belly full of unknown. That's literally the belly of the whale. Um, but I think what you're going to see, too, is when we're, especially when we're talking about trilogies or sagas or anything like that, there's going to be some cycles of the hero's journey that you could almost see in each installment. And then there are larger ones that you can see in the entire trilogy and in, in the entire saga that goes through all of those to the right. end. Smaller cycles inside of larger ones. Um, but, uh, yeah, Belly of the Whale... As, as an end of departure, I think that's probably easier seen in something like Lord of the Rings that was immediately built as a trilogy. Because at the end of, like, Fellowship, they're not really um, able... Like, the Fellowship is broken into a few different sections. They're kind of on their own, and they're going down different paths now. 
into what is going to be an unknown and essentially a much deadlier, darker place for all parties considered. Um, that's probably the closest approximation I would give when we're talking about the first part of it, like a trilogy trilogy. I know if we're using Farscape as an example, at the end of each season, they usually do something like that, where they've kind of, like, they've not necessarily beat the bad guy, but they've kind of gone up and around that hurdle, and then they kind of leave the cliffhanger for the next season on, like, a lower note of, like, we're not sure what's going to happen. Right. Like, it's a place of uncertainty and unknown for the audience, because the characters are also, like... I think in the between first uh, season one, season two, it's like they end with uh, Dargo and John floating out in space, Moya having just starburst away, Aaron trying to pick up John and Dargo, and not sure if she's going to be able to make it. Uh, so right. you start off the season mm-hmm. where it kind of recaps of what happens, and like John's just waking up from being passed out or whatever. Yeah, and it's but they leave it on that the belly of the unknown. It's like. Suddenly, there's this thing going on where we're not really sure what's going to happen here, and mm-hmm. they've got to wait and see. Yeah. Well, I think in a much broader scale, um, that's the whole idea of the cliffhanger. Yeah. For the end of seasons. Like, you see that on television all the time. Yeah, and then they never finish their show. <laughs> well, I think that's because the actual belly of the whale is, are we going to get renewed for another season? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> that is that is actually very true. That is um oh god, that's Firefly. <laughs> like their actual belly of the whale was at the end where they were like, Are we gonna get renewed for another season? <laughs> the answer was no. No, no, they're not they're gonna get a movie. They're gonna get a movie eventually, that's something. But but I think just in general, like like you were talking about with Farscape, a lot of times in television, that belly of the whale is a really great point to end your season on because it makes people want to know how you're going to get out of it when the next season starts. I would say that in mythology, since we, you know, Campbell did, was probably looking at this kind of stuff, uh, if we were to go back to the Odyssey, which I, I feel is probably the main story he was probably looking at, just because it's such a famous one, I would say the belly of the whale in that is when they're when they finish the war and Odysseus and his crew are going to get back on the ship and have like declared victory. Yay. We've, we've won the war and they piss off Poseidon. I mean, who doesn't exactly? (laughs) Well, Poseidon is the kind of character that gets easily pissed off, (laughs) but, but that moment where they piss off Poseidon and Poseidon's like, Oh, okay. Well, you're about to go on one wild ride, folks. <laughs> and and then they end up in, like, the storm that leads them to a whole bunch of trials that uh, go badly. Very. Uh, but hey, you know what? That's the kind of thing that we will really have to talk about more with Initiation, which is stage two. So, um... Just before we move on to the next part, though, out of out of the three stages that we're talking about, do you find Departure to be a particularly interesting one? I know that it has a tendency to, since it feels like the beginning of the story and not necessarily like the middle or the end of the story, sometimes it might feel a little bit, I'll be honest, boring. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you find that, but sometimes I it, find it, it that way. It honestly really depends on which... Like, who's telling the story and what they're doing for it? But yeah, it can be boring. Um, Other times, it's really interesting. Like, suddenly you find out about this person's backstory and why their call to action is meaningful. And it's like, oh, that's really fascinating. And other times, it's like, oh yeah, Luke's call to action is because his his aunt and uncle got killed. Yeah. So he has nothing to go home to. So it's it's not as interesting. It's more tragic, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, um... Yeah, I, it's not always my favorite stage of things. Beginnings are hard to get invested in. Yeah, they they have to do a lot of setup work, and uh, usually they have to do a lot of world building in a general sense. Yeah. Um, and and that can feel like you're setting a lot of groundwork for the future, but you're not necessarily getting there. <laughs> um, you, you know, we're not at Godzilla versus Kong. Not we're yet. going into the 
No, no, we're going on to the the backstory of what why we know there's a Kong and we know there's a Godzilla. Yeah. And and that can be fun. I would hope that like great storytellers or great narrative folks would be able to make just that initial part also engaging by itself, but it is definitely a challenge. It's not something that you can just immediately do. You're not automatically great at doing it, which in many ways is also the writer's version of the hero's journey. You are not necessarily proficient in what you're doing yet. You might not even really understand your characters fully when you start telling their story. Oh, I, n- I never know my characters fully before I when I start them out. I'm like, I don't know what this character wants to do yet. I don't plan that out. I let it grow organically. I think you have to think a little bit more about how much of the character you just know at the point where you start the story. Yeah. Um, and, and what you can inform yourself about with what that character is, poss- is, is able to do. That can lead you down some really interesting paths when you start. But as a general idea, the, the hero's journey is set out in a, a structure. It's definitely more structured than maybe some storytellers are used to. But I always thought that it was an interesting framework to get people into just to start thinking about how you've seen it in different media and how you might want to utilize it in stories yourself. That's Departure. And when we come back on the next episode, we are going to be talking about initiation. And that's where things, that's where we really get into the belly of the whale. So that's um, where we depart the belly of the whale, (laughs) depart the belly of a whale. Okay, and so that concludes part one of our three-part series on the hero's journey about departure. I hope you enjoyed it. Please come back next week so that we can talk a little bit about initiation. That should be an interesting one. Until then, make sure to go over to DelveCast.com while it is still up and operational and check out all of the stuff we have over there. Make sure to check out our Patreon. We will still have all of those Patreon things up even after we rebrand. Uh, and start the new show, so you'll still be able to get some of those exclusive pieces of content and extended episodes, etc., from the old show, if that interests you. Thank you to our Shiny Level patron, Body Ainsworth, and our Discord Shiny Level patron, Drunk Paul. You help keep the digital lights on. Make sure to follow us over on Twitter. I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is currently at Delve Podcast. Stay tuned for all sorts of new information. As we start wrapping up Delve and start beginning Total Pebble Knockdown. Until next time, thank you for joining us on this first stage of the hero's journey. We like to think that we've been going on this journey with you. Thank you for making us a part of your day. And we'll see you next time. Goodbye, everybody.